For those of you watching online, we want to welcome you to Lynchburg City Church. Once again, my name is Joe. I'm the pastor here. And uh, if you guys want to stay up to date with what's going on at Lynchburg City Church, you can follow us on social media, on Facebook, on Instagram. I definitely encourage you to. And uh, if God puts it on your heart to give to Lynchburg City Church today, you can do so by going to lynchburgcitychurch.com. And with that, I want to pray for us, guys. Lord, we love you because you first loved us. We love you because you first loved us. Wow, Lord, I I pray that today we might experience in a realer sense the, the... theology behind those words that we love you because you first loved us lord we uh we think of the president right now we pray for his health we pray that you'd give him wisdom um he and the vice president and the speaker of the house that you would help them to make good and wise decisions lord we uh we think of our country in general we pray lord Um, for its well-being. We pray for the the good of the city that we live in. And we pray that you would help it and that you'd protect it. We think of our soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, coast guardsmen, those who are in harm's way, who are serving. And we pray for their safety. We pray for their protection. We pray for their salvation because so many of them, Jesus, they don't know you. And Lord, for our enemies, we pray that you would confuse and frustrate their plans and that you might be merciful and save them too, Jesus. Lord, um, we think of the persecuted church. I'm thinking of Leah Sherabu, this teenage girl being held still by Boko Haram in Nigeria because she's a Christian. I'm I'm thinking of Pastor Yusuf in Iran in prison because he's a Christian. I'm thinking of Pastor Wang and Pastor John in China. I'm thinking of our brothers and sisters in North Korea and Nigeria and Eritrea and Albania and and all over this world, Lord. We remember those who are in chains as if in chains with them. And today, today we want to hear from you. Lord, I pray that you would encourage our hearts. Lord, that you would free us from distraction. And I pray that I would say exactly what you would have me say. If there's something I shouldn't say, don't let me say it, Lord. And if there's something I need to say that maybe I haven't even planned on saying, I pray that you would give me a word today. Jesus, help us. We need you, Lord. We really, really need you. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Today we are in part 25. Part 25 of our journey through the book of Acts. And our story is going to pick up today in chapter 12. Up to this point, understand that the apostles had been largely untouched by the persecution that followed Stephen's death at the end of uh, chapter 7, the beginning of chapter 8. But the situation is radically going to change once we come to chapter 12, once Agrippa 1 comes to power. And we begin in chapter 12, verse 1. It says, About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. And so Luke begins the retelling of the story with this vague reference to time, right? About this time. And evidently that meant about the time that the Antioch church from last week was preparing to take its relief offering to Jerusalem. And considering the history of what we know of Herod Agrippa I, that is the Herod of this story, the time most likely would have been around the spring of AD 42 or AD 43. And really for us to understand, well, why is there this shift right now? Where the apostles, they weren't really experiencing much persecution, now they are. Well, we need to understand this man, Agrippa I, or referred to in the story as Herod. He is the grandson of Herod the Great. And you probably remember Herod the Great because he did all the big building projects in Judea, in Palestine. Herod the Great, he was the one who interacted with the Magi at the time of Jesus' birth. He was also the one who sent the death squads to Bethlehem to kill all the baby boys under two years of age. That's Herod the Great. 
He's also the same Herod the Great that had his own son put to death in 7 BC because he viewed him as a threat to his throne. And so once Agrippa I's father is killed by his grandfather, well, he and his mom, they go to Rome. And it's in Rome where he's going to be raised and spend those years of his childhood among the Roman aristocracy, uh, learning along with them. And this is going to play such an important role in Agrippa's life because the childhood friendships that he formed while in Rome will ultimately lead to him taking over and having power one day back in Judea and Palestine. Specifically, in 37 AD, when Caligula becomes the emperor, and he gives Agrippa I the title of king and makes him ruler over the territories that were once ruled by his uncle Philip, the lands in the Transjordan, the Ten Cities, that is the Decapolis, north of Galilee. And once again, for Agrippa, much of his good fortune ultimately is because of who he's friends with. I mean, You've heard it said, it's not about how much you know, it's all about who you know. And that really tends to be true here for Agrippa. His good fortune is due to these childhood friendships like the one he had with Caligula. But despite the fact that he's raised in Rome, he, uh, he made bad choices along the way that ultimately get him into trouble. He ran up lots of debt with creditors in Rome. He flees to Palestine. But that wasn't really the tipping point. In fact, the tipping point didn't come until he made some less than ideal comments that got back to the new emperor, Tiberius, and at that point, he imprisons him. And he will stay in prison until a new emperor, Claudius, comes to power in AD 41. And when Claudius comes to power, once again, this is one of his childhood friends, he releases Agrippa, and he gives him even more power and rule in Judea and Samaria, which was a really big deal because those regions had been under Roman procurators for the last 35 years. And so for Agrippa, he he could not rely upon always being in the good graces of Rome. I mean, one wrong step and he finds himself in prison or maybe even worse. And so Agrippa begins thinking, I've got to take necessary steps to ensure my power. I can't, can't always be banking on Rome and the good graces of the Romans. And so he's thinking, I need to win a good portion, a good constituency who are powerful and who are influential. And he does this ultimately by taking aim at a certain religious minority sect known as the Christians. And and this is what is happening here in chapter 12, verse 1. This is why up until this point, as I said, the apostles have had relatively um, not a lot of persecution until chapter 12, verse 1. And it was about that time the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And so just as Jesus had predicted, James would drink of the same cup as Jesus did. James becomes the first apostle to die, uh, apart from Judas. And he is the only apostle whose death is recorded here in the New Testament. James here is James, the brother of John. Uh, the son of Zebedee, the sons of thunder, not to be confused with the James who wrote the book of James. And it says that he's executed by the sword. If this was done in Roman fashion, he would have been beheaded. If it was done with the Jewish mode of execution, which forbade beheading because it viewed it as a desecration to the body, he would have had the sword run through him. But bottom line is this, Luke retells this murder Uh, with such brevity, because it's not going to be his main focal point in this story. Rather, he's going to use it to springboard to the main point of the story, and that is God's deliverance of Peter. Verse 3, And when he saw, so when Agrippa saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread, and when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. And once again, I don't think from Agrippa's point of view, this was something that was personal. As we talk in the introductory remarks about who Agrippa is, he's trying to ensure that no one's going to come and bump him off, or that he's not going to end up in prison again. And so... We see he kills James, everyone's happy. He's like, wow, this is working. And we really see Agrippa step into the, just kind of a, a very political type role that he's in, as any seasoned politician of 47 years might, right? That's Agrippa. 
That's, that's, that's who he is. And when he sees it's happy, he's like, wow, okay, I want to play to my base. My base is happy that we killed James. Well, let's, let's do it again. Let's make them happy. And that really seems to be Agrippa's motivation right here. And so Luke notes that this took place during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And this is significant because you're like, well, why doesn't he just kill Peter right away? Why doesn't he just kill Peter? Well, the fact is he cannot risk losing favor with the Jews by executing Peter during the feast. That would be considered a desecration. And so he puts him in prison. As the text tells us in verse 4, that he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him. This is quite a heavy guard, though not terribly unusual. But they would ultimately change guards every three hours throughout the night so that those on duty had the maximum amount of alertness. And Peter, you would argue, I think it's fair to say, he's in the maximum secured wing of Agrippa's prison. And no doubt someone will say, well, why all this necessary security? I mean, it's just this guy Peter, right? It's not like he's a terrorist or something. Why, why the security? Well, no doubt Agrippa has probably heard of the story back in Acts chapter 5 where the Sanhedrin looked like absolute fools when they imprisoned Peter and the apostles. You remember the story, perhaps, the Sanhedrin, the Jewish Supreme Court, they're jealous of all the success Peter and the apostles are having, and so they take them and they put them in public prison. I, they really want to make a point when they do this, right? That if anyone wants to go down this road, you want to be associated with these guys? Well, this is what's going to happen to you, right? I mean, they want to make it front page, and of course, an angel comes, rescues them, and then they look like fools because they have no way to account for how these guys who were put in public prison, how they made it out. And I'm sure Agrippa has that story in the back of his mind. He's thinking, well, this isn't going to happen to me, right? We're, we're going to lock this down. I'm not going to make that mistake. And so there's Peter, right? He is in his prison cell. He is chained to a soldier on his right. He's chained to a soldier on his left. There's two more guards right outside the cell. I mean, there's no way he's getting out of here. Agrippa's learned from the Sanhedrin's mistakes. He's not going to make their mistakes. And yet, Agrippa's going to learn the hard way of the folly of opposing God, as we will see. He, he would have been wise, I think, to, to heed the warning of Rabbi Gamaliel back in Acts 5. Acts 5, when they were prisoned in prison before, uh, and... They were put in the public prison, they escaped, they couldn't account for that, and then the Sanhedrin bring them back. And remember what Rabbi Gamaliel says? He's considered one of the wisest rabbis of the time. He says, listen, it's best not to mess with these guys. If this is some engineered religious sect, then nothing's going to come about. It's going to fade away. It's going to amount to nothing. But let's hypothetically say that what they're saying is legit. Just say then we could be found even opposing God. And the Sanhedrin heed the words of Rabbi Gamaliel. I think in the back of their mind they realize, yeah, that, that's true. It's best never to be found opposing God. And yet for Agrippa, this will become his undoing. He, he is going to set out on a course that is so foolhardy and so dangerous and ultimately will be fatal. And the mistakes that Agrippa is going to make in this story, I think, honestly, are, well, there are mistakes a lot of people make because they want to do their own thing. Or like Agrippa. I mean, he cares what people think. I mean, this is a lot of his motivation, right? He wants to play to his base. His base is happy they killed James. So he really cares so much what these people think. The problem for Agrippa, he doesn't stop to think about what God thinks about this. And that will become fatal. And I realize today, I think a lot of people, they don't really care what God thinks. Also, they don't really know God. They don't know God. They don't really know what the Bible says. And many of those people, many of them, they call themselves Christians, they go and they create their own view of God. Which usually involves justifying their sin on the basis of overemphasizing one specific characteristic of God. It's usually his love. I mean, I feel like every other worship song is about God's love, right? Every other one. And let me say, the love of God is a beautiful thing. It really is. But 
there is more to God than just his love, Christians. There is. God will not be pushed around. More than that, he pushes back. And I don't think we think of God as someone who, oh, he won't be pushed around, or he'll sometimes, he'll push back. I don't think we really think about God that way. Jeremiah does. Look at Jeremiah 21.5. I myself will fight against you. This is, this is God's warning to his enemies in Jeremiah 21.5. I myself will fight against you with an outstretched hand and strong arm in anger and in fury and in great wrath. I mean, he warns the hypocrites at the church of Pergam- Pergamum in Revelation 2.16. Therefore, repent. And if not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. In other words, like right here, I just think it's like, okay, like Agrippa, you you really want to push me around, Agrippa? You really want to drop the gloves and go? Like I see what you're trying to do. I see the unjust treatment of James when you murdered him. And I see what you're about to do to Peter. And enough is enough. And I'm coming for you, Agrippa. And once again, I'm thinking of Rabbi Gamaliel's words. Be careful. You could even be found opposing God. And this is why it's so important to know what God's word says. I mean, last week we we saw this in Antioch. Barnabas goes and gets Saul. They come back. They got all these new Christians. What do they do? They teach them the Bible. What a novel idea. They, they teach them the Bible. They spend an entire year there. And our ignorance will be no excuse. It will be no justification that we can ever use. And this is why when we have church gatherings, it's, it is so important that the Word of God be the primary focus. And yet this is not always the case. In fact, the Word of God sometimes is rarely the case around the world in churches from coast to coast in Virginia, in Lynchburg. It's not emphasized. It would be a a great frustration of mine. I remember back when I was in seminary here in 2009, and I would go, and we'd spend like a minute reading the Bible. And then it would be like this. Let me tell you about my story, camping. Let me tell you about my story in the Army. It may or may not have anything to do with this Bible story, but that doesn't matter. We read the verse, now let me just, you know, or it's a comedy show or whatever, right? No, no, this is a serious thing. This is a very, very serious thing. Agrippa is going to make a, a very miscalculated mistake for, for as smart a guy he is, is trying to politically maneuver and win over a base to s- secure his power there in Judea. He's going to make a critical mistake because he cares. He cares so much about what other people think and he makes the mistake of not caring enough about what God thinks. What does God think? Well, we need to first open the word to see, just like we're doing today. And so verse 5, this is what it says. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Right there. Verse 5. Peter was kept in prison. Earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. You know, we read that. And I think we read that, and I have before, where we read that, and then it's, okay, next verse. They pray, right? Okay, we've done that. It almost seems that like within the church, the prayer becomes this obligatory thing. I got to pray, then we can can get to work, right? You find yourself in crisis mode, okay? Maybe it's a a relational crisis. Maybe it's a financial crisis. Maybe it's just a conflict resolution crisis. Maybe it's a crisis with the job or, or whatever it may be. Here, Peter's about to be executed. Kind of a big crisis. And, and usually, if we pray, it's, all right, we've got to pray. All right, amen. All right, now let's get to work, right? Now let's make a phone call. Now let's call a friend. Now let's file a complaint with human resources. Now let's look up our legal options. Now let's call the, the ACLJ, not to be confused with the ACLU, right? Now let's call the Secretary of State, right? Let's call our local congressman, right? Man, we're going we're gonna to get to work. We're going to fix this problem. I was like, what is the church doing? They're not doing any of those things. None of those things are wrong. 
Not that those things are wrong, but what are they doing? They're, they're, they're praying. Earnestly. Fervently. And I've realized, as one who's grown up in the church, that this is something that we don't take the time to kind of smell the roses on. To realize, as James tells us, it is the prayer of a righteous person that has great power. Like, when we pray, we have a direct line with the creator of the universe. Did you know that? It's like, imagine, right, you're cut off behind enemy lines, and you are being overrun by enemy forces, and you pick up the phone, and you radio in, you're like, I need help now, and in the next 60 seconds, there's A-10 warthogs flying over you, literally raining hellfire down on the enemy, slaughtering them all. Do you know that, Christian? You have the ability to have that type of connection to God, to call the commander-in-chief. I mean, imagine, right? If you were in a jam and you had the ability to call President Trump, right? You don't like President Trump, whatever president you like, but you get my point, right? You, you call him and he's like, I'll fix that, done. You're like, oh, that's amazing, right? You have that ability, Christian, to do that. But I find for, for many of us, when it comes to this issue of prayer, prayer, I think, seems like a distraction from productivity. So we have the obligatory prayer when a crisis hits and our anxiety is like bucking the ceiling. And then at that point, it's like, okay, we got the obligatory prayer out of the way. Now let's go and try to fix this problem. And that's why like, one of my favorite Piper quotes is this. If prayer ever seems to you like a distraction from productivity, remember that God can do more in five seconds of you praying than you can in five hours on your own. It is not a distraction from productivity. Peter is about to die unless God comes and intervenes and saves the day. And what are they doing, man? They are on the call with the commander and chief, with the creator of the universe interceding on his behalf. Oh, that we would see prayer as more powerful. Not just as an obligatory Christian thing we do. And I think sometimes we, we do, but it's like, I don't know. That's, we miss the imagery, I think. And that's why, I don't know, for me, like, I, I think of that. Right, that imagery, like, you're, you're behind enemy lines, you're, you're, you're under attack, and you're calling in an airstrike to help you, and then 60 seconds later, bombs are dropping, coming to your rescue. If Peter's not rescued, he dies. Uh, the stakes are very, very high. Notice what it says in verse 6. Now when Herod was about to bring him out, right, he's got to wait for the feast to be over, and then he can execute him. He's about to bring him out. On that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. Once again, there's the imagery, right? Peter is sitting there, sleeping. He's chained to a guy on his right, chained to a guy on his left. Two more guys are outside the jail cell pulling security. And uh, he's sleeping. I'm going to go on a limb and say that when you battle with anxiety, stress, maybe you're like me, it's hard to sleep, right? That, that situation you're dealing with, maybe some of you guys are dealing with that situation right now. And then you're like going to bed and all these thoughts, man, you're, you're, your brain is just flying. You just have such a hard time falling to sleep because you, 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 you're so stressed and you're so anxious. And I'm like, out of all the anxious, stressful things I've, I've ever dealt with, I've never been on the verge of being executed, right? And I'm thinking, how is this guy sleeping, right? He's sleeping. And here Herod, here Agrippa one, he thinks he's got the situation well in hand, right? This is a slam dunk. It is over. Yeah, God, God has some other plans, Agrippa. But oh my, how was Peter able to sleep? And I, I think, and here's the, how I'm going to argue this. I think Peter is able to sleep by learning to trust in the promises of God and remembering the past performances and faithfulness of God. That's how I think he's able to sleep. You're like, okay, Peter's able to sleep by trusting in the promises of God? Well, like, like what? What promises? Like 1 Peter 5, 7. A promise that Peter will later write about. 
where he advises believers to cast all their anxieties on him because he cares for you. He cares for you. Promises like that. See, our our normal tendency when it comes to worry and anxiety is to try to fix it ourselves. If we're being honest, that's our normal tendency, I think. We want to fix it ourselves. And that's why anxiety and worry and fear are often connected with pride. We want to take care of it. We want to make it happen. And, and the promises of God are like this. Cast all your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. In other words, give it to Him. Trust Him. Lean into Him. Lean into Him. In those moments when we're like, Lord, I, I can't. I've tried to do everything possible and uh, I need your help. It was funny how it ends up working backwards, right? Usually after we've exhausted every possible option, then we start to lean into him. As one commentator notes, affliction either drives us into the arms of God or it severs us from God. It does. When, when hard things happen, it, it has a tendency either to drive us into his arms or to sever us from him. And... Peter is saying, cast those anxieties on him. Cast those stressful situations that I know some of you are dealing with right now onto him because he he cares for you. In other words, that last statement, he cares for you, God is not indifferent to the problems that you are facing. Man, I remember there was this one young lady years ago, and I don't know, it might not just be a lady thing, maybe it's a, a guy thing too, but I remember it was like, she was like single, 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 single. And then she got married. And when she got married, I felt like her nose was in the air and just like looked down on the, all the younger girls. I'm like, you were just like, like not married as like, like six weeks ago. It's like, she's like arrived now. I don't know. That's just something I noticed both as a single and now a married guy for the last six years. Uh, that sometimes there's maybe pride factors that come in there. And I remember hearing her just vent her frustrations like, like this, this like girl, like she's 18 or she's 19, she has no idea what like real stress or anxiety is. And I'm thinking like, okay, in one sense, maybe that's true, but in the same sense, I'm just like, where's your empathy, right? I know it doesn't seem like a big deal to you. I know it might even come off as annoying, but listen, you're farther along in your life uh, than, than this girl is. Like, like, where's your care? You've been there before. You know what that's like. I get it. It's not the end of the world, but in that moment, it can feel like the end of the world. And that's why I love that last statement. He's like, cast your anxieties on him because he cares for you. He does. He's not indifferent. Your problems, the stress, the anxiety you're dealing with, it's it's not too little for him. Like, oh, I can't bother him with these things. No, no, no. He says he cares for you because you are his children. And... I love, I love that, right? How is Peter able to sleep there? Yeah. I think Peter's able to sleep, um, at least one of the ways, by trusting in the promises of God and remembering the past faithfulness of God. Promises like First Peter 5, 7. And so it says in verse 7, And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a a light shone in his cell, and he struck Peter on the side and and woke him, saying, Get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands, and the angel said to him, Dress yourself and put on your sandals. Notice what it says here. And he did so, and he said to him, Wrap your cloak around you and follow me. Verse 9. And he went out and followed him. This is the part I wanted you to notice. He did not know. Peter does not know what was being done by the angel was actually real. He didn't know it. He thought he was seeing a vision. And when they had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them of its own accord, and they went out and went along the street, and immediately the angel left. And when Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure the Lord has sent an angel and, and rescued me from the hands of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. Peter evidently has no idea what is taking place. The angel 
has to direct him at every single moment. He's like, Peter, get up. Peter, put your clothes on. Peter, tie your shoes. Peter, please follow me. And what becomes very, very clear is that this is not Peter's escape. No, he's, he is escaping. No. This is not Peter's escape. Rather, this is his deliverance. It's God doing what only God can do. Peter is totally passive through this entire episode. And what we witness here is how Agrippa will learn the same truth that the Sanhedrin had learned before him, that there is no prison that can hold those whom God wants out. There's no prison that can hold those whom God wants out. I'm thinking of Job 42 too. I'll throw that up on the screen. I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Agrippa, you cannot thwart the plan of God. Or in Isaiah 14, 27, throw that up on the screen. For the Lord of hosts is purposed, and who will annul it? Agrippa, you will not annul his plans. His hand is stretched out. Who will turn it back? Agrippa, you will not turn back his hand. It's not happening. There is no prison that can hold those whom God wants out. You say, well, what about James? James died. Let me be very clear. James does not die prematurely. There is no Christian who dies prematurely. Agrippa is able to kill James for one reason, and that God signed off on it. That's it. James dies because it was God's time for James to come home. That's it. And it is not Peter's time to come home yet. It is not. You know that, Christian. For the Christian, there is no, yeah, he died accidentally, or she died accidentally. That doesn't happen. God is never up to me like, whoa, Gabriel, Michael, you guys took the week off? Like, they died accidentally? Like, that never happens, folks. That's just bad theology. (laughs) It is. And furthermore, because when we talk about the sovereignty of God, right? He's sovereign. Everyone says, oh yeah, he's sovereign. No, no, no. When I say he's sovereign, I mean he's sovereign over everything, the good and the bad, because that's what Ephesians 1.11 says. Ephesians 1.11 tells us that God governs all things, I love the emphasis on all things, not just good things, all things, according to the counsel of his will. He governs all things according to the counsel of his will. And if we can't trust God to sovereignly govern the bad things, How can we trust him to sovereignly govern the good things? James does not die accidentally. Agrippa did not win the day. That was time for James to come home as God had ordained it. Peter's fate is not in the hands of Agrippa. It's never been in Agrippa's hands. It's been in God's hands just as James' fate was. Oh, Christians, we have a really, really big God, a much, much bigger God than I was ever taught about when I grew up in the church from a little, little boy. I always had this very small idea of God. Oh, what a puny little God, right? He needs our help. We have to assist him, right? He is not a puny God. In fact, there's a book written called Your God is Too Small. And I think for the majority of Christians, that's probably the case. Verse 12. When he realized this, so he realizes this is not a dream. He's like, oh my goodness, God just saved me. An angel just came. This all just, okay, I got it, right? So when he realizes this, he went to the house of Mary, and she's the mother of John Mark. Apparently she's a wealthy woman because she has a house big enough to have Christians there, have people gathering there, and she also has a servant. So when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. And when he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer, and he makes his way to Mary's house, which would suggest that the believers gathered there regularly, like he knows that they're probably going to be there, and so this servant girl comes, it says in verse 14, recognizing Peter's voice, in her joy, she did not open the gate. but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. And then she gets into an argument, verse 17, and they said to her, you're out of your mind, Rhoda, right? But she kept insisting, no, 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 it's really true. 
And they kept saying, no, it's not. It can't be Peter. It's just his angel, right? The whole time, Peter's like, oh, are you going to let me in? I'm like a wanted man. Please open the door. <laughs> this is like the, the, the epic movie scene where, you're, where you get to the point where you're yelling at the characters on the TV. Uh, so he's, he's outside, and uh, Rhoda gets into an argument with the believers in the house, and they won't believe, and they say, no, it's just his angel, which I always thought was kind of a strange response, like, why would you not believe her and then argue that it's just his angel? Well, within Jewish thought, there was this thinking that each person, once again, this is Jewish thought, okay, Jewish thought, there's not a Bible verse for what I'm going to say, despite the fact that you were probably raised to believe this. Within Jewish thought, there was this belief that each person had their own guardian angel who could, at times, assume the form and appearance of the one that they were protecting. That was, that was the thinking. And so when Rhoda comes in, they're like, no, it's just his angel. It's not really him. And it's interesting because they're in the house. Peter's about to die. They're praying for him. What are they praying for again? Oh, that's right. He's about to be executed. Right. So <laughs> he's about to be executed. And they're praying that God would, I don't know, rescue him, like do a miracle. And, and I really appreciate Luke's transparency here because they're not necessarily in the most positive light. Like to a certain degree, you're like, are they, are they doubting God right now? Like, are, are they? Like, what's up? At the very least, I think we could say that they're surprised by what happens based on their response in the next verse. But Peter continued knocking. Poor Peter. He's just out there. I don't know how long this happened. You really wonder how long he's outside knocking. As a wanted man who's just escaped a maximum security prison, <laughs> Peter continued knocking. And when they opened, they saw him. And they're amazed. They're, they're amazed. Maybe they were doubting. Maybe they're just surprised. You wonder, because there, there's moments, I think, in our lives where we're praying, and then, like, God answers our prayers, and we're like, no, that can't be God answering my prayer. That was just too quick. I don't think he works that fast, right? Like, I don't know. Like, we have the most bizarre thoughts sometimes. At the very least, they are surprised, I think, by the timing of God's response. And they would soon discover, as Paul would later write in Ephesians 3.20, that our God is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. And right there, there's another anxiety-killing promise. That our God is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. Yeah, that'll, that'll kill anxiety right in its tracks. And this comes back to this connection with prayer. Right? The, the, the power of prayer. Like, when you pray, you have a direct line to the Creator. A direct line to the Creator of the universe to call in that air support, right? On your situation. That's a big deal. I, I think too often we play down the power of prayer in our lives. God comes through right here. Oh, Christians, prayer is not a distraction from productivity. God can do more in five seconds of you praying than you can in five hours on your own. It is a powerful thing we do when we pray and we bring our requests before the one who spoke the universe into existence. And so Peter comes in, finally. There, of course, I imagine all freaking out. He's like, shh, shh, hang on, I'll tell you. Let me just tell you, right? But Peter motioning to them, verse 17 with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, tell these things to James. James, this is obviously not the James that was just executed. Rather, this is the James who is the little brother of Jesus, the ha little half-brother of Jesus. And he is the same James who wrote the book of James. He will become and really emerge as the leader of the Jerusalem church. He's like, listen, I can't stay long. Here's what happened. Be sure you tell James, tell all the other brothers. Let them know how God totally came through, answered our prayers. 
But then he departed and went to another place. You can imagine the next day, Agrippa is having a bad morning. Verse 18, now when, when day came, there was no little disturbance among the soldiers. No little disturbance, right? That's an understatement over what had become of Peter. And after Herod searched for him and did not find him, he examined the sentries and ordered that they should be put to death. This was pretty customary. If you're a soldier, if you're a guard and you let your prisoner escape, it's your life for his life. Which typically you didn't lose prisoners that way. People were just really highly motivated to, uh, to, to <laughs> perform, right? Uh, I'm glad that's not like part of the grading curve today in college. That would be very scary and stressful. Um, verse, he continues, right? And he says, then he went down from Judea to Caesarea and spent time there. So he travels from Judea down to Caesarea, spends time there. And it says in verse 20, now Herod... <clears throat> was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. And they came to him with one accord. And having persuaded Blastus, the king's chamberlain, this was like his personal attendant, and they persuaded him, they asked for peace because their country depended on the king's country for food. And so when we get here to Caesarea, there are these two cities, Tyre and Sidon. They're free, self-governing cities on the coast of Phoenicia. Um, apparently they've been quarreling, we're not really sure why. They come to Herod, uh, the, excuse me, they go to Blastus first, they want peace, they're trying to sort all this out, because at the end of the day, they're really concerned. Apparently Agrippa has the economics like, play here against them, and they, they need his country for, for food. And it says in verse 21, On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne, and delivered an oration to them, a speech to them, right? And the people were shouting, the voice of a god and not a man. I mean, these guys were like brown nosing it up big time. <clears throat> What's interesting in the story is that Agrippa seemingly becomes more and more arrogant. And so by the time he arrives here in Caesarea, it's full blown on display. Full blown. And, and the ironic thing is, is that Agrippa is asserting his importance in a city where Caesar's the real political power. Remember Cornelius back in Acts chapter 10? Part of the Italian cohort? Where was he based out of? Caesarea. Here's Agrippa acting like he's like the man. He's not the man, especially not in Caesarea. Caesar is the man. Rome is the man. And it's interesting because Josephus, the Jewish historian, in extra-biblical accounts, records the same story. How on the second day of the festival, Agrippa entered the theater at daybreak, clad in a robe made altogether of silver and quite wonderful weaving. (laughs) Josephus similarly notes that Agrippa would not repudiate the adoration of the crowd and its flattery. The voice of a god and not a man! Yeah, that's right. Keep it coming, right? (laughs) He's he's not going to be like, he's not cutting them off. He's not repudiating them. He is just enjoying the applause. Then immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory and he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. I love this story because it is sweet Texas justice right here. (laughs) But the word of God increased, verse 24. And it multiplied, and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had completed their service, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. Agrippa is opposing God all throughout this story. And even today, in 2020, we see glimpses of this in ways, quite frankly, in the United States that maybe while not as severe by any account as what other Christians experience is still alarming. It is. And that's not to somehow make uh, little of the global pandemic that we have. But you remember from the very beginning. You remember from the very beginning. Flatten the curve. Do this. Do this. And I think as a Christian, there is a responsibility. I think we're like, all right, yes, we're on board. I think most churches were. And then it continues, and it's like, no, you still can't meet. No, if you meet, we're going to shut off your power. No, if you meet, we're going to threaten you with lawsuits. No, if you continue to meet under any circumstances whatsoever. I don't care how you're meeting, what you're doing. It doesn't matter. You can't meet. Walmart, Costco? Yeah, you guys are good. Like... (laughs) It is. And that's why this story is so reassuring. 
amidst such circumstances. Here's Agrippa trying to shut them down, trying to intimidate and harass the Christians. And we see the enemies of the gospel had attempted to hinder its progress in Jerusalem, and God enables his word to grow and multiply. Agrippa, Agrippa cannot frustrate the plans of God. Nor can Trump, or Biden, or Harris. They cannot frustrate the plans of God. I mean, this story is an anxiety-killing story from the very beginning. I mean, where Peter is about to be executed, and he's falling asleep on like the eve of his execution between two soldiers. This is a story that shows us how foolish a thing it is to oppose God. And even more foolish to think that God will tolerate opposition to him or anyone else, including a king, a sovereign, or a president. He will not. And if you think he will, your God is too small. He is. I love this story for those of you who battle anxiety, who battle worry, who battle fear. I love this story when you see injustice, especially against other Christians. I mean, the people we pray for every single week, like Leah Sherabu, Pastor Yusuf, Pastor Wang, like, like Pastor Joseph, like all, like all these people. No, God is seeing every single thing that's happening, just like he's seen every single thing that Agrippa's doing. And this ultimately was Agrippa's undoing, as it will be for every person who is in opposition to God. Whether they're in a person in, in a position of power or not, every person in opposition to God will meet Agrippa's fate, if not in this life, then in the next life. I said earlier, yes, we have a very loving God, but man, I am thankful that we also have a just God. You have a just God. And quite frankly, he doesn't tolerate crap. And it ticks him off when he sees his people being treated like this. That's why at the end, man, how do you get a better ending than that? Being destroyed by this parasite, bacteria, disease, and Agrippa dies. I mean, just such a torturous, terrible death. But it is a picture, right, of the death that awaits every single unbeliever out there. Every single unbeliever, right? Which is why it's like, oh man, it's like in one sense we're like, yes, I'm so happy, this, this sweet text is justice, but at the same time, there's a lot of people out there like Agrippa. You've got moms and dads and brothers and sisters who are like Agrippa in opposition to God. And I love like, the grace of God in the midst of this story in verse 24, but the word of God increased and multiplied. The word of God is increasing and multiplying and people are coming to know Jesus. Wow, we've got a great God. A great God. And so as the team comes today, I want to pray for us, guys. I want to pray that we would be changed by these truths. That this would be more than just a Bible story. So God, I pray that we would experience the theology behind this story. From your justice on display to the anxiety-killing promises on display. Lord, I pray that we would just, like a sponge, squeeze this story so hard and that we would grow in our understanding of who you are, Jesus. Lord, you, you see the injustice that is done today, just as you saw here in this story. And I pray that that would encourage us, Christians, May it encourage our hearts. May we take heart, Lord, as we learn more and more and more about who you are. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.